energy consumption and the environmental impact in the U.S. So let's talk a little bit about what the options are. Um, solar hot water is really the only large-scale commercial use of distributed solar thermal in the United States. It is not a technology that requires somebody like me to do a lot of research on. I do it anyway because I want to make them better. But systems are very well developed, technologically advanced. Um, they are rated and certified by the Solar Rating and Certification Corporation. Um, these are very robust systems. The economics of using a solar water heater are excellent. Payback periods are on the order of much less than the, than the lifetime of the system, so 10 to 15 years. Um, it's a slam dunk, as people say, everyone should have one of these. Um, really, there are some impediments to their use, which is pretty much building codes, um, how your houses are oriented, how do you protect the sun space on your house from your neighbor's bigger monster house? So there are some issues, but this is something that we should be doing in the United States. Um, there are 10 million gas and electric water heaters that are shipped each year. So we have even a new, for if you just want to put in new systems, there's an opportunity for 10 million. The projection is that there's less than 1 million out there now. So big growth. Um, the other thing about... Uh, solar hot water is that it allows individuals to do to make a difference so we don't have to rely on our utility companies it creates local jobs so this is an opportunity to grow the local jobs in your community it releases natural gas for the more important uses in power production natural gas is very important for utility companies because it can provide peaking power and it's clean and it can actually provide peak load capacity, which will prevent you from having to build new power plants. So there are a lot of advantages to solar systems. This is a very traditional looking flat plate solar collector. Um, it basically looks kind of like a skylight when it's up on your house, and they can be installed so that they're very, very attractive. The other solar thermal systems that are used in commercial buildings is a really nice system that's used for Commercial buildings usually have to be ventilated, so you need to bring in outdoor air. And this is a good way to warm it. So basically, it's just a perforated plate. You pull, pull air in, hoping that's not me. Um, pulling, pull air in through this black perforated plate. That's a solar collector, and it preheats your ventilation air. Well, what are the opportunities for savings? Um, there have been really only two people who've made estimates of what solar hot water could do in the U.S. Uh, me and one of my colleagues at the National Renewable Energy Lab, we don't agree with each other. Um, but that's what happens when you start to make projections of what people will do. Um, so my projection was kind of a realistic, what if 50% um, of all the electric water heaters and 20% of all the gas water heaters uh, were replaced with solar, and that solar only provided half of your water heating. In other words, you still had to have a backup electric or gas. What could it do for you? His approach was, let's take all the roof surface in the United States, figure out how much of it is not shaded, and we'll assume that all is covered with solar thermal. So we come up with very different number, but the bottom line is I think my number, which is pretty conservative, is still quite remarkable, and that means that if, if this were to be the case, and we were to all put solar hot water systems in at that level of installation, that that would be exactly the same as taking 7 million cars off the road, not making them more efficient, getting rid of them. His projection is 50 million cars, so you can see we do disagree. But um, nonetheless, this is, a, this is an important thing to do. Now, what's hotter? The hotter systems in solar thermal are the ones that, that use mirrors to concentrate the sun, and there are really three basic kinds. So I'm showing you um, them here by the level of concentration. So in other words, how hot can you get? And on the left are the parabolic troughs. So what you see here is the sun's rays coming in. You know, of course, they come in parallel. And then they all bounce over to this tube where you have the oil running through the tube, heats the oil up in the tube, and then you can take it to a regular power plant. And these parabolic troughs are the most um, commercially employed system uh, of all of the concentrating systems. They concentrate to 100 suns. So basically what that means is if you assume that the sun arrives here as one sun 
and then you use these mirrors, you get the equivalent of, of 100 sons. And, well, I grew up in Tennessee with three brothers, and we always were outside burning things with the magnifying glass. Um, and this is basically the same thing. So I hear you laugh. You must have done the same. Um, in fact, you can buy little Fresnel lenses at the museum stores so that you can go outside and do burn the grass, burn some leaves. Bugs are fun. So um, when you're a child, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but basically, this is the idea. So you get 100 suns. So you can imagine the ty kinds of temperatures you can get. So the temperatures are up at about 750 Kelvin. Um, which is somewhere around um, 500 degrees Celsius. I'll have to think about what that is in Fahrenheit. It's really hot. Um, these are the power towers. So this is the one that I showed you that's in Sevilla, Spain. The mirrors in this case are flat mirrors as opposed to this curved mirror. And the flat mirrors have to do um, multiple axis tracking. So they have to go east, west, and um, also um, they have to track um, as the earth moves, so from, from sunrise to sunset and then as the day changes. And they bounce the sun's rays up to this receiver, and these can concentrate at about a thousand suns, so ten times more than the parabolic troughs. These are not, it, there are not as many of these kinds of systems. In the United States, there's only a um, experimental one, but other countries are employing them now. And then the last is what's called a dish. So this looks like a satellite dish, um, you know, like a television satellite dish, and, uh, but bigger, but not lots and lots bigger. They're, they're actually transportable on a truck, and they have the best concentration ratio, so you can get up to 10,000 suns with them. They're usually run with what's called a dish sterling engine, which is just a heat engine to produce electricity. Um, they do on-axis tracking, so they follow the sun perfectly and they can get very, very high temperatures. These two systems, as well as this system, but with some restrictions, can be used to produce electricity and to produce fuels. So what's going on in the U.S.? Well, this type of system won't work for Minnesota and it won't work for Iowa because you need to have a higher solar insulation level than we have here. Uh, but they're excellent for the southwestern part of the United States, parts of Texas, Arizona, Nevada, California. And um, they are the lowest cost solar option to produce electricity in the United States. Um, but they're still somewhere around 12 to 14 cents a kilowatt hour. If you compare that to wind at 4 cents, let's say, per kilowatt hour, um, you actually pay more for electricity than, than I do. Um, so, but this is, this is more than we're paying now. The hope is that by 2020, they'll be down at three and a half to six cents per kilowatt hour, but other types of power production will also have efficiencies and prices will go down. So it's not clear how these will compete, but remember that the cost of electricity today really doesn't take into the externality costs of the environment. So um, if, once we start to price that out, the view is that in the southwestern part of the United States, these will be the power plants, the solar power plants that will go in. Um, they actually have um, pretty good conversion efficiency, 12 to 25 percent, which may not sound too good to you, but actually it's, it's, it's very competitive with um, most of the traditional technologies. Capacity factor is how often it runs, so 30 to 75 percent. I said that these are intermittent. Um, people are looking at storage now for those types of systems, and I think they're going to grow quite a bit. There's a, um, almost five gigawatts installed or planned right now across the globe for these types of systems. Okay, so what do I want to talk about now? This is how you use those systems, not to produce electricity, but to produce fuels. I call it solar after dark. Um, because basically when you use solar energy to produce a fuel, you have stored it. So um, that's an actual picture of the moon blown up really large, but if you can see the man in the moon there. Um, the idea is that you take the same infrastructure that's used now to produce electricity with the optical mirrors, and instead of heating up steam in that top of that tower or at the focal point of the parabolic trough, you do, you take some type of chemical reaction 
that's a pr that works at that temperature and can produce a fuel. You do that in the daytime, and then at night, you have the fuel. So that's why I call it solar after dark. It's basically a storage mechanism. You're storing the energy as a chemical reaction. And that's just depicted here. So instead of producing electricity during the day, you make the fuels. You can also produce electricity. And then you, in a chemical reactor that's on the top of that, that tower, and then you can use those fuels to run a fuel cell or whatever is appropriate for those fuels. You can actually make gas as fuels. You can convert those to liquid fuels and use them for cars. Um, this is an evolving technology. There are no plants anywhere in the world that do this. There are about to be some, though. And there's a lot of work going on in laboratories across the world. Um, and it's expensive right now, but the feeling is that it will be cost competitive when the cost of carbon is taken into consideration. So this is a pretty complicated slide, but I wanted to give you a feel for what people are thinking about when they talk about solar fuels. Um, and what I think the, the first thing to look at is right down the middle. This is what you can do today. You can use the sun's energy or you can use wind energy. You can elect electrolyze water, and you can make hydrogen. So I call it solar hydrogen. If you want to do something different than that with a thermal process where you're actually taking uh, into doing chemical reaction, then there's kind of two routes. You split water, and you get hydrogen and oxygen, and hydrogen is your fuel. Or you do what I call decarbonization of, for example, coal. And I like this side. And the reason I like this side is so obvious. It uses a renewable feedstock, so the feedstock is water, and it uses a renewable energy source to power the production of hydrogen, and that renewable source is solar. On the right-hand side, your feedstock is no longer renewable, but available. Your energy source is still solar. So it's still better than simply burning the coal, because now what we're going to do is take the fossil fuels, could be natural gas, could be oil, and we'll change them into products that include hydrogen, and unfortunately we still end up with some carbon dioxide, so you could sequester it, but you've basically upgraded your fossil fuel because you put the solar energy into it to produce the fuel. So in my laboratory, we work on this side because we like to think far in, into the future and we think this is the way to go. Um, it would be nice if you could just heat up water and split it. Um, but unfortunately, this diagram is, I'll, I'll, I'll show you quickly how to read it, but this diagram says that's a bad idea. So basically, what I have here is temperature, and this point right here, which is 3,500, Kelvin. See, I did change it to Fahrenheit. It's 6,000 Fahrenheit. And on the vertical axis is the, the fraction of the products that come out as a certain species. So when you have 100% of the product being hydrogen, that would be quite nice. So what you see is that at a, at a, this is still pretty high, 200 mm -hmm. Kelvin. You heat up water, and what you get out is water. Okay. Of course, it's not liquid anymore. Um, yeah, supersaturated steam. But as you start to increase the temperature, you start to break down the water into lots of components. So there's just the hydrogen molecule, uh, oxygen, uh, hydrogen itself, uh, OH, which is a radical, and oxygen. And what we're interested in here is the red line. So this is hydrogen. So what you see is that until you get up to about 6,000 Fahrenheit, you don't have any hydrogen. So just heating up water isn't going to work. Well, then the other problem is when you get up to this temperature, you either can explode and lose everything. It's very difficult to separate the products, if not nearly impossible. So this just doesn't work. So you have to do something more clever. You can't operate in that temperature range. So what people are thinking about doing, it's a two-step process. And um, they use metal oxides. So basically what you do is there are two chemical reactors. One is the one at the top of the solar tower, and the other one is someplace where you want to use the hydrogen. And so what you do is you take a metal oxide.